Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Today we're gonna do what I hope is gonna be kind of a, a The Broken Life mini episode. We've been doing a lot of The Broken Tech episodes lately. Uh, the audience pretty uniformly hates all of those. So I wanted to get something mechanical worked in. Plus I know there's a couple more Broken Techs coming out soon and we're doing some stuff in the shop that isn't repair stuff. So I wanted to reassure you guys in actions here that we do still work on vehicles around here we still got a ton of work to do so today we're here with the tj and we've got to replace the oil pressure sending unit on it and there are a few videos out there of guys doing this already but most of them are on four cylinders this is a six cylinder so this is a four liter jeep and that sensor is going to be right back by the distributor that little brass guy right down there that guy so that's what we're going to do and the reason that we need to replace that when i was still daily driving this thing which at this point it'd be two winters ago now is what i'm talking about when it was cold out this thing going down the highway at like 60 miles an hour even if it had warmed up for let's say five or ten minutes first would just about peg out the oil pressure gauge it would come up to almost 80 pounds and you might be thinking that's a good problem to have you know everybody knows low oil pressure or no oil pressure is bad for your motor that'll kill everything high oil pressure is almost just as bad because if you're running way too high of oil pressure you'll start blowing oil past all your seals and on an older vehicle like this this thing's 21 years old now the rear main and the front crank seal and all that stuff is already on borrowed time it already leaks a little bit so if it is truly blowing 80 psi of oil pressure that's bad but apparently super common on these things for the gauge sending units to go out and start telling lies like that that's why we're going to be replacing it today is because i want to have an accurate oil pressure reading on my dash when i'm driving this thing with that explained, it may not be as straightforward as just replacing the sending unit. It's my understanding that early TJs like mine apparently have a gauge sending unit that reports actual pressure to the gauge, and later TJs just have one that just gives you a gauge that lies. It's basically oil pressure, not oil pressure, that they don't actually report the true oil pressure. And there are different part numbers for those two oil sending units. For whatever reason, manufacturers started doing this in the mid-2000s. I think it's because people would get freaked out when they would see changes in oil pressure as they drove you know people that don't understand cars and don't know why that happens you know they expect it to be like their you know their alternator or their engine temperature where you know it, it just does one thing pretty much the whole time you're driving and that's that so i went out of my way to try and order the correct part number sensor for this thing and from the jeep dealership they're stupidly expensive i think they're like 60 or 70 bucks a piece so i got on ebay and found a place saying they were authentic oem chrysler sensors and this this thing is what they sent me. And as you can see, this is not in a Mopar bag. This is in a Ziploc bag and it just came in, you know, a regular cardboard box and everything else. So I have my doubts of whether or not this is going to be the proper sensor, but it seems the part. It has the part number printed on it in a way in which it looks factory. It has the factory applied thread sealer that it should have. And something else I noticed about this is I looked at a couple of other people's videos before jumping into this. And one guy mentioned that it's an inch and a quarter socket on his XJ and his was, I think like a 2004. This guy is very clearly inch and a sixteenth or whatever metric equivalent. I have an inch and a sixteenth wrench and it fits this perfectly. It also fits the one that's on it perfectly. So it might also be, and I don't know this for sure, that the different sensors actually take different size wrenches too as a way to help differentiate them. So at least so far so good that they're both the same size and neither one of those sizes is inch and a quarter, which on his, it should be a dummy sensor. On mine, it should be real. But since I don't truly trust the sending unit that we bought, because it in no way other than its own appearance looks like it's an actual Mopar part, the first thing we're going to do is start this thing up and let it come up to operating temperature and we're going to watch the behavior of this gauge. And basically if the behavior of this gauge doesn't change between the new sending unit and the old one, I'm going to say it's probably the right thing. And I know just a moment ago I said that the sending unit that's in this will report like 80 PSI and I don't truly believe that's happening. That only happens when it's super cold. The rest of the time it behaves just like it has for the last 15 years I've owned this thing. Uh, warm idle is somewhere around 40 pounds and going down the road it'd be about 60 normally. So that's the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to start this thing up and let it come up to operating temperature. Plus since we're going to dump the oil anyway it's just good to change hot oil and all that good stuff. And this thing still has gas in it that's over a year old. I don't mind burning it off. So it's been running for about 20 minutes at this point. 
Uh, looking at the dash from the, you know, through the window here, it looks about normal to me. If you know Jeeps, you'll probably know that my temperature gauge looks low to you. I think I actually have like a 180 degree thermostat in this thing instead of the 190 or 195 that uh, Chrysler calls for. Just a matter of preference. I'd rather have a little more buffer if something ever does go wrong to know that it's about to overheat. Like on really, really hot days with the AC on and the fan clutches in, it'll get up to like 210, but I can like watch it creep that way and it's never gone over. With the low thermostat, I can see that if it ever goes over 210, I know something's screwed up. I'm gonna go goose the throttle a couple times just so we can kind of watch the gauges move and then we're gonna get to installing that other sender. So now it's hot and it's off. Let's go get that other sender thrown in and get this old oil drained out of it. And the first thing I'm gonna do is kind of a temporary measure is this wire harness routing. It looks weird to me, but no one has ever worked on this thing but me in the last 15 years or so. So that's probably the way it's supposed to go. I'm also gonna pull the negative battery cable off since we're messing with sensors and stuff. But I just wanna try and get a zip tie on this and get it out of our way. And when we're done, we'll just cut that zip tie back off. Now our next move is we have to push this little orange tab down here. That has to be pushed up from the bottom in my case. No, I'm sorry, down from the top. Now we should just be able to squeeze that connector and take it off. You're not wanting to budge. Of course we can't see anything. So what I think I'm actually gonna do is just give that guy a quarter turn in the offward movement to see if we can get a better feel on that connector. Wow, is that thing really that loose? Of course, I'm at a bad angle to try and get the wrench on it now. It feels ultra loose. It could just be because I have a giant wrench too. No, it's ultra loose. <laughs> that wasn't much more than finger tight. Keep that in mind when we go to torque her back down. But now it looks like I can push this a little easier. There we go. Yeah, plenty of mung down in there. We'll hit that with some spray silicone before we put it back together. Now just continue to take Mr. Finger Tight here on out. Let's take a minute to compare our old guy here to our new guy. Uh, they have different part numbers. This one's a 5602-8807-AA. You can see this new guy's got like rounded off corners on it, so clearly not from the same supplier. This is an 051490644AA. So it could be that this is just a part number change because it's a different supplier, or it could be that this is the wrong sending unit altogether. Either way, we're going to hang on to our old guy here and just throw him in the reference drawer for a while, and we'll see how our new guy works out. And if he's not the right thing, we'll try and dig up one of these guys, maybe new old stock or something. And also, before we get real carried away, we should look at these pins. So the first thing I'm going to do is just try and plug the new guy in. Feels like it's going to go in just fine. Let's hit this connector with some silicone spray and get this guy finger tight it in and then from what I felt not a lot more than finger tight feels like one of those things I should look up a torque spec for but I don't think I have a socket this big that would fit on my torque wrench anyway and it's probably an inch pounds and I also don't have an inch pounds wrench so we're just gonna play the game where I don't give myself much leverage with the wrench and just continue to feel it I don't know how well you guys will be able to see but I'm only giving myself about three inches there of force on this wrench. I'm just pushing with my thumb. I don't think it was any tighter than that when we started. So we're going to call that good. And if I'm wrong, I can always come back and tighten it more. But once I crack it in half, it's hard to back it off a turn. We've got our silicone spray. See if I can get on it without making a huge mess. I'd kind of like to not actually put it on the connections. And dropping the straw is going to help me. Take two. Eh, whole connector's full of it, but whatever. She's greased up. And I've kind of taken to liking doing this rather than dielectric grease. Just seems to work really nice. It's a little cleaner usually. Okay, she's popped on there. Pushed our lock in. That should be all there is to it. I'll cut this zip tie off later after we start it up again and make sure it's actually reporting oil pressure. So the next thing to do is get under it and change the oil. Right there is the oil filter and right there is the exhaust. 
Uh, they tuck the exhaust way up on these things so you can off-road and not get hung up on stuff, but it makes it a real bear because every time you spin a filter off, you just dump the exhaust with oil. So I almost never change the oil in this thing hot. So we're just going to drain the engine oil and probably let it continue to cool down before we spin that filter off. The fun thing about having a thousand different cars from a hundred different manufacturers with none of the same motors so I can never remember what wrench anything is. So I always have to climb under everything with a hundred different wrenches. And I usually put magnetic drain plugs in my stuff so they're not factory size anymore. But today this one's 5 eighths. It feels like it's also pretty freaking tight, like disturbingly tight. Am I going the wrong way? Am I doing something dumb? There it goes. Yeah, I get a little paranoid about drain plugs sometimes. So this one's got a little tighter than it probably ought to have been. But it also didn't fall out. Whoa, almost got the camera. <laughs> Don't think this guy is the magnetic plug. It isn't, but I'm pretty sure I have one around here for it somewhere. So I'll see if I can dig that up while we're waiting on her to drain out and cool down. Boy, this oil just looks super thin. <laughs> wow, I'm really, I mean, it's still warm, but it isn't hot. Yeah, that's got a bunch of gas in it. I feel pretty guilty for letting that exhaust manifold go on as long as it did. Over the years, I must have bought at least two or three different magnetic drain plugs for this thing, and now I can't find any of them. Up until like three weeks ago, I had two of them sitting on my toolbox, and then I did something with one of them, and I bet that was the one for this. I even checked to see if I did something smart and put it in the Jeep, and I did not. But anyway, this is half 20, half 20 thread. I just ran a dieth over it. That's what size it is, so we'll order a fifth one or whatever. So I've intended to do it ever since I've owned this thing and never have. And I did also just have a commenter mention something about drain plug gaskets and the little washer seals that on foreign cars you have to replace. This is the stock one for the Jeep, which I've confirmed because it is not magnetic and it has a rubber gasket made into it for life. So these are sealed up uh, pretty much permanently unless the rubber starts breaking down. And this one is getting old. And I, as I've said already, would like to replace it, but can't find it. So we'll order yet another one and we'll catch it next time. See if we can torque it to 85 foot pounds just like the last time. Okay, it feels like plenty. Let's give everything a nice little wiper roomy. This thing does leak some oil out of the rear main and probably out of the valve cover and everything else. It's 21 years old, you know, that's what you get. But it's not too bad really, especially as far as Jeeps go. These things are notorious for dropping puddles and it does okay. Let's do our best to kind of shuffle things under the oil filter. It's by now it's been shut off for about 40 minutes, so it shouldn't be too terribly hot anymore. Right down yonder there is our oil filter, and you can just barely see uh, the outline of the drain pan there under it. We're just kind of taking our best guess. Always makes a mess doing this on this thing. I may actually have to get the camera out of here to grab it. Mm, yep, gonna need the filter wrench. Pretty sure this is our guy. Uh, recently I was watching somebody's channel, I don't remember whose, and they had never heard of these before. These are oil filter sockets. Uh, this one happens to be metal. I highly recommend those versus the plastic ones, and they are awesome. They're way better than like strap wrenches and stuff. I think this is the right size for the Jeep, so let's try and get it stuffed in there. That's our man. Let's see if we can get a ratchet on it too. Actually, we're going to do that the other way around. We're going to put the ratchet on it and then put it back on. Just want to make sure that was the right size before we started fighting 10 different things and dropping it into the frame where it'll never be recovered again. At least now it's in the drain pan. Let's try again. So we can finagle it past that wire harness. There we go. There, nice and loose now. And you totally do not want to use those sockets for installation. <laughs> like this thing, I'm not sure if it's truly that tight or not. I'm just gonna let that filter drain for a second. I don't know if it's truly that tight or not, if it's just that it's been on here for like two years because this thing doesn't get any miles. She's off. I'm gonna try and lift it out and we're just gonna go put it in the drain pan and hopefully not make a huge mess. Giant mess averted. I want to show you guys something else that's kind of cool too, because surprisingly my quick little video on the Escort oil filter upgrade 
It's actually one of the more popular ones on the channel, so I thought I'd show you this quick too, because it's neat. Uh, this is the, at least in Mobile One, this is the part number the Jeep calls for. It's an M1204, and I just happen to have one of these sitting around from forever ago. So we're just gonna throw it in today, uh, just to burn it up, because I'm probably not gonna leave the oil in it very long this time, just to try and flush as much gas out of it as I possibly can. But here's the cool part. <laughs> Guess what was in the box? <laughs> freaking magnetic drain plug that that wasn't the cool part i didn't know it would be in there so apparently i tried to do something smart like a hundred years ago yeah and that's even half 20. however this guy has a washer and i'd prefer not to use a washer style so i don't like this anyway but however we found the drain plug we could technically still put it in it's got the, like the world's weakest magnet though just barely holds its own weight but anyway mystery solved that's where at least one of the drain plugs went but the cool part is so there's the filter the Jeep actually calls for. Here is the filter I use. You can see this filter is almost twice as big. The Jeep runs a six quart oil system from the factory. This makes it more like six and a half, six and three quarter quart. What this filter fitment is, is for a five liter Mustang for a Fox body, so for a Ford 302. So if you have a TJ and you wanna run a giant filter, and you could, you could see mine fit just fine. Some guys say they do, some guys say they don't. My guess is that the Maybe the four cylinders they don't fit on, but on a four liter, at least my four liter, it fits great. But if you want to run this big filter, just go down to the parts store and say, yep, uh, oil filter for a 91 Mustang 5.0. But since I just want to burn up that oldie that's been sitting around for a hundred years with that train plug in it for that long too, apparently, we're just going to throw it on for today and we'll put a, a good big one back on probably in a few months. And just while it's also on my mind, uh, anytime before you put an oil filter on, a new one, you should check these and make sure there's not like a bunch of steel burrs or anything on them. I mean, this is a, this is a Mobile One filter. It's like $13, so I've never seen any problems like that. Actually, it looks like maybe I just got some on my glove. I've never seen any problems, really, or significant ones, but it never hurts to check. And then just give them a nice wipe off overall. Just make sure they're clean when they go on. And then we'll just touch our finger and some of the dripping dirty oil up there to lube up the gasket before we put it on. Since these go on sideways, you can't really pre-fill them, which sort of sucks. But while we're under here, I told you guys this would be a chassis grease video too. I'm probably not gonna take you along for every step. I'll just show you, because to some people this might be interesting or foreign or whatever. Believe it or not, all the steering on this thing's only like three years old. And I did paint it before I put it all on. The paint I used, I'm not very happy with. And you know, I live in salt catcher country. But every single piece of paint, in fact, the whole front axle was painted three years ago. So we need to touch that up. But anyway, so the ball joints and stuff are brand new. Those are Spicer ball joints because that's what everybody said to run unless you want to spend big money. And just the top ball joints greasable. These are Moog anti-sway bar links and they have a grease circ in the top, which will help keep them from breaking because TJs are notorious for breaking sway bar links. Uh, they're actually articulated up there, which was something I'd never seen before except on a TJ. Tie rod end at the frame has got a zerk on it as well. Tie rod end at the steering box has a zerk. The tie rod ends at the spindle also have zerks. And what I like to do is just go around with a paper towel and wipe them all off. I'll also take my grease gun and shoot a little bit of grease through the tip of the gun before I put it on, just so any junk that accumulated with it just sitting around gets blown out. That's gonna pretty much do it. So I'll get all this stuff greased up. I also like to like all this old grease that's seeped out. I like to wipe all that crap off the boots and everything. In fact, for these being basically brand new boots, I'm surprised they're leaking that much. And I guess one more thing I'll talk about just quickly is I really like these style grease guns, the pistol grip style. I actually have a like an air-powered Harbor Freight one that is just horrible, it never worked right. So I give it away to my dad. And the lever pump ones, I really hate because you need two hands to run them. But since I'm probably not going to do too many oil change and chassis grease videos in the future, uh, just food for thought, I really like these guns. If you don't have one, highly recommend it. I think it was, I don't know, 30 or 40 bucks at AutoZone. Just another quick word about my grease gun here. I also put a second hose on it. So this has like 24 inches of hose on it now. And that big ball of duct tape right there is just where the union is. So a lot of the times I'll reach in a wheel well through the fender and I don't want to scratch up the fenders or anything with those steel fittings in there, so I just put a ton of duct tape around it to pad it up. Really like that setup. I'll give you another quick tip here about greasing stuff. As you go along, don't wipe off each fitting as you go. Wipe them all off at the end when you're done. That way you know which ones you've done. So all these have a little bit of grease hanging off of them. That's how I know that I've greased them. 
So if I look stuff over quick and I don't see little grease stringies, I know I missed it. And just also, FYI for your fun here, this is also, I think, the WJ steering update. update. So this is a solid tie bar linkage off of a WJ and not a TJ part. Just for fun, figured I'd show you because we're probably not going to talk about it again. Let's try this again and call things by the right names this time. This guy is actually the track bar, this guy here. If you hear Jeeps getting death wobble, it's usually attributed to this guy wearing out. And it connects right back here at the axle. If you're not a Jeeper, you might also have heard of this called a panhard bar. So this is what keeps the axle centered up in the Jeep. And when these bushings wear out, it will wobble. That's your death wobble. So yeah, that is the track bar, not a tie rod end. These guys, Jeep does call tie rod ends. So one tie rod end with a zerk at each end of it. The track bar just has a zerk at one end. At least this one does. The other tie rod end which we believe we did identify correctly, but this is the WJ upgraded tie rod end. So this is a solid tie rod end. The TJ ones are hollow. I think that handles our corrections for the episode. So we got our new filter put on, got our funnel cleaned up and in the valve cover ready to go. We got our full case of Mobile One here. A case of Mobile One, it's six quarts. I don't normally like buying quart size, but they were on sale at Sam's. It was an offer that was too good to refuse. So now I have to put up with the annoyance of opening six of these and peeling the foil off of six of them and blah, blah, blah. But Let's get them in there. I've just changed my tune possibly for life. No foil. So we may just be buying only quartz from now on. Awesome. So it's got six quarts in it now. So the next thing to do, unless you are an absolute monster, is to pull the dipstick and make sure you actually see oil on it. Seems like I would have noticed six quarts of oil running out of the garage and down the driveway, but so far I haven't, but you just don't not check the oil before you start one up. We are pretty much exactly like half a quart over full, which is cool because the filter's empty. So this is looking good. This is plenty to start it up with. And the next thing I always do is I just start it up long enough for it to get oil pressure, and then I shut it right back down and check the oil. Because I have had filter gaskets and stuff explode on me before, and you don't want to be pumping five quarts of oil onto your garage floor. That sucks. So there it came up and got full oil pressure. Let's start taking a look and seeing if we see anything spraying oil. Looks like our new sending unit is dry. That's good news for now. Let's get under it and see if there's a puddle. No puddle, which is good since I scooted the cardboard away from everything. I usually try and leave the cardboard under things until we're actually running. Again, I've had seals explode on me before. So yeah, that's the end of the oil filter. I don't see oil running out of it and at 50 pounds of pressure, it totally would have. Now we're gonna check the oil level again because only a monster wouldn't do that. Wipe our stick again. It's surprisingly dark. I'm gonna guess that's just still residual oil in the tube. And it's actually just a little, oh, kind of hard to say. If I just go by what's dirty, it's a little bit under full. The stick's pretty shiny the whole way up. Yeah, pretty much the same result. Still kind of dirty. Still a little under full. That's okay. So what we're going to do is right now, unbelievably, even though it's been a couple hours since we ran this thing earlier, the radiator is still just a touch warm. So we are going to come back tomorrow and let it run up to temperature and everything then again. And before we light it off to run it up to temperature again, I'll just check the oil again and see if anything settles out of the dipstick tube or whatever. And if it's still a little low, we'll top her off before we run it. So it's the following day and I've got a slight change of plan. I'm actually not gonna top this thing off on oil until we run it again and see what that sending unit's doing. And the main reason for that is if the oil is still as dirty as it looks like it is on the dipstick, we're just gonna dump the oil straight out of it again and change it again with cheap oil and probably dump it again and so on and so forth. Because if it's really that badly fuel diluted, we don't want it anyway. So let's get her fired up again. So it's been running for about 20 minutes again and the radiator itself is getting hot so I know it's as up to temp as it's going to get in regard to cooling anyway. So I'm going to go goose the throttle a couple times again so we should be able to watch that oil pressure gauge move around and I'll review the video and see what I think about it.
it seems like we've got a nice responsive oil pressure gauge to me. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly the same as before, and I don't know if we actually fixed anything, so I'll have to wait until it gets to like negative 20 again to see if it's actually reporting what I think is weird. Just wait and see. But anyway, yeah, looks like that sending unit is what we want. It would be nice to see what a newer Jeep sending unit reports to that gauge when you rev it like I just did. And you know, I only have experience here with my 99, so I've never seen like a an 06. If anybody out there knows, get in touch. I'm just curious to know. So now that we're done running it, it's time to check the oil again. And if it's still super dark, we are going to dump it right back out. It's looking a little more healthy. You can see it's still kind of dirty on our towel. We'll dunk her again. I would say that's a healthier color. It's still a little low, so we must have just had uh, some dirty oil in the dipstick tube. So I'm just going to toss just a little bit more in it to top it off, and I think we're going to say that's okay. Just for fun, let's wipe the stick again and just see how it looks on the towel. Not bad. Dirtier than brand new clean oil, but I don't think it's so fuel contaminated that we need to worry about it. So I got the oil all topped up, and with that, I think that's going to conclude this episode, which I said was going to be a mini episode, but I'm betting it's not too mini with all the extra crap I added to it. Never know if you guys like that or not. Uh, we'll find out as time goes on, but these are the videos I like to make. You know, show you the little details and things as I'm going. So I do hope you do like them as well. Now, one final comment on this thing is as rich as it was running for so long, uh, it's actually somewhat of a question in my mind It's whether or not we might have a fuel injector that's leaking in the not too distant future at all. I'm going to do a full tune up on this thing. So we're going to put new wires, plugs, cap and rotor on it. And when I pull the plugs, if there's one that's like ultra soot coated and the other ones are just gross, we'll see that right away. And likewise, I'll keep monitoring the condition of the oil after the tune-up. And if I have a plug that's going black, then I'll know right away. Because it should just be one. You wouldn't expect all six injectors to be leaking like that. But who knows? So far, this entire video has been me fixing problems that may not actually exist. So, you know, I specialize in that anyway. But, as always, guys, I want to thank you for stopping by. And we'll catch you on the next one. I'm Max, that's Saddington Bear, and we make videos like this all the time. Here are a couple links to some other videos we've made, and we really appreciate you guys stopping in.